Uh, let's uh, make a start. This is the 14th uh, meeting of session four of the Public Audit Committee. So welcome to uh, members, uh, any public and press who are here as well, and to our witnesses who will come to in just a moment. Can I start by asking everyone to make sure their phones are switched off? <clears throat> We have received no apologies uh, this morning. I think uh, all committee members are here. Um, item one is to decide whether we should take items four and five uh, in private. That will allow us to decide how we take forward uh, the evidence we hear at our public sessions this morning. So can I ask members if they uh, are willing to agree to take items four and five in private? Agreed. Thank you very much. Um, we move to item two, for substantive item on our agenda this morning, which is taking further evidence on the section 23 report, managing ICT contracts. Um, and so I want to welcome Sheena Adams, who's Keeper of the Registers of Scotland, uh, Katrina Hardman, who's the Deputy Keeper and the Accountable Officer, uh, Ian Campbell, who's Chief Information Officer at Registers, and John King, who is Registration Director. Uh, welcome. Um, I think I'm right in saying, Ms Adams, that you didn't want to make an opening statement. That's right. Okay, okay, so so maybe, so maybe I can uh, <clears throat> kick things off uh, then. Uh, we, we asked uh, Registers of Scotland to... Uh, come and give evidence to the committee. Uh, as a result of the Audit Scotland report, which looked at ICT contracts in the public sector, and they looked at three contracts in particular, and one of those was the Registers of Scotland contract, and the committee were very keen to hear from Registers of Scotland uh, some of what had happened, and also, I think, maybe to look forward and see what lessons had been learned. Um, I guess we picked on Registers of Scotland because um, the figure involved was probably that was the highest of the three. Um, so uh, the Audit Scotland report looked at the strategic partnership agreement, which Registers of Scotland had had with BT, initially expected to cost £66 million over a period of years, uh, but uh, in the end costing around £112 million, so almost twice as much. Um, but in spite of that additional cost, it proving itself not capable of providing the kind of service that registers required, and indeed ending up with the contract being terminated uh, 20 months uh, early and a, a different strategy having to be adopted. So maybe I could just kick things off by asking uh, generally uh, what registers of Scotland feel went wrong and why so much money was spent on a project which ended up not being able to deliver what it was supposed to. Okay, thank you, Convener. I think two things. In terms of what went wrong, um, our view is that the partnership agreement was probably always the wrong type of contract for registers of Scotland uh, because it put all the eggs in one basket with one supplier. It was for literally everything to do with IT and telephony and it was obviously for a very long period of time. Uh, obviously, too, we are you know, we're reasonably big in terms of the public sector. At that time, we, the contract was entered into, we probably had about 1,400 staff. That's down to about 1,000 now. But in terms of our size compared to the supplier, we're obviously a, a very small organisation. Uh, clearly, there were issues around governance, and partly that was due to the fact that the governance arrangements were provided for in the contract and tied BT and ROS very firmly together in, in the governance arrangements, which in some ways meant that the ROS board and the ROS management team didn't have a, a clear line of sight to the contract overall. Also, as part of the, the contract, it was designed in such a way that the intelligent client function sat with the supplier rather than with the public sector body, which meant that ROS didn't have the skills in-house to challenge uh, the supplier and to uh, make sure that you know, what was being proposed was actually fit for our kind of business needs. In terms of cost, 
uh, it was always intended that the contract would spend more than the initial sum. Uh, if you take it up to 90, uh, sorry, 2012 levels, the initial cost was in the region of 78 million, and that figure is mentioned in the Audit Scotland report. Uh, up to uh, August, April, the 112 million yes, has been spent to up to the, the 1st of April, April this year. Uh, as I say, it was always intended that, that the, f the figure would increase because obviously with such a long contract you couldn't possibly envisage at the beginning what exactly you would need to spend. In terms of the overall kind of assessment of the contract, I mean clearly some of it has worked. Um, you know, the BT have provided our basic services uh, right across the IT telephony board you know, over the, the eight years that the contract will have lasted. BT uh, will now leave on the 30th of November. We had brought forward the termination date. So, you know, services have continued to run. We have had a desktop refresh. We have delivered our automated registration of title to land project and several other successful projects. Uh, only two projects you know, didn't come to successful fruition. One was eSettle, which obviously was in the Section 22 report, uh, and the content management system, and they were obviously cancelled um, because the eSettle project would have required considerably more investment to get it up to a level where it was usable and also it wasn't capable of being changed to meet the, the changes that we knew would, by that time we had known would be coming in because of the, the 2012 Land Registration Act uh, and the content management system obviously we cancelled on value for money grounds. So while we, you know, in summary we think that the contract was the wrong approach and obviously none of, the, none of us, none of the current management team were in, well, were employed, well, were in post in Ross in 24 when the contract was signed. Uh, and obviously some of this is a benefit of hindsight because I'm sure our predecessors thought that they were doing the right thing. But our assessment is it, it, it wasn't the right thing and that both Ross and BT were looking for different things from the partnership. And you, you mentioned size there, which is quite an interesting point because um, in the Audit Scotland report when they looked at different ICT contracts. Um, you're, you're right, Registers is by far the biggest of the public bodies and Audit Scotland themselves um, clearly thought that most public bodies were, were too small to procure or sometimes too small to have the expertise in order to procure this kind of contract and I think you're saying that even Registers of Scotland which was at the big end of that found that quite difficult. Um, one of the ways around that is within the public sector for support to come from outside, from the Scottish Government. So I, I wonder if you can explain how the, 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 the problems which developed across the Strategic Partnership Agreement could have developed over, what, a 10-year period without support from the Scottish Government to try and resolve some of that. Did, did registers ask for help and was that help made available? We asked for help on when we were developing our automated registration of title to land project, which ran late, and we sought advice from Scottish Government on how best to handle discussions with BT, and they gave us very helpful advice on escalating the issues within the BT hierarchy. And ARTL obviously was delivered and has been functioning and being used by customers, but it was only part of the contract that actually had a late delivery payment uh, clause built into the contract. And we levied that late delivery payment on BT and charged almost a million pounds against that. And obviously the Scottish Government was helpful in that. And we also had help from the Scottish Government in doing post-project reviews for the two projects that we cancelled, the Settle project and the content management system. And both Ian and Katrina are working with Scottish Government colleagues in developing the central government digital strategy that Scottish Government is working on at the moment. But there is a sense in the Audit Scotland report that there was very little support in, in the early stages and in the, the, the procurement and the course of the um, the partnership agreement. Is that is that not? Our understanding is that Registers of Scotland did actually get external support on uh, doing the procurement and actually deciding what kind of partnership arrangement to go for. Um, financial advice was uh, given by Grant Thornton, who, funnily enough, were our external auditors until recently, and from PwC on strategic matters and on what was McGregor's and which is now Pinsent Mason on legal matters. So there was clearly a lot of external input. Um, I'm not clear what discussions there may have been with 
what was then Scottish executive colleagues. Um, but certainly, obviously, you know, Register of Scotland is a non-ministerial department, so we're not actually part of the Scottish mm -hmm. Government, though actually we're part of the Scottish administration. And we do now work closely with Scottish Government colleagues on all these kind of issues. And obviously, we shared our lessons learned from our experiences with Scottish Government back in May 2011. And you, you, you said that the, the Ross Board at the time, and I appreciate that you weren't part of it, in fact, none of the witnesses were, were part of that senior management team at the time or the board, didn't have oversight of, of the, the, the project. I mean, are you saying that within the organisation Nobody did. Was was there not some kind of project board, partnership board, some some internal body who had responsibility for it this was, project? There was a, it was structured within the contract. There was a partnership and change group which was made up of registers of Scotland and BT staff, which took day to day responsibility, and then things had to be escalated to the a partnership board, which again was made up jointly between registers of Scotland and BT staff, and which was chaired by the Keeper. I mean, I have chaired it recently, obviously, since I've become Keeper. Uh, but there was little visibility up to the main Registers of Scotland board. Uh, and also at the time, there was no delegated budgeting in place within Registers of Scotland. And because projects were running behind time, um, what was coming to the board was that we were actually underspending on the contract, not that things were escalating and not being delivered. Obviously, clearly there was um, uh, reports on particular projects, and certainly up until about 2009, the focus was on ARTL. Uh, and then once that was delivered, eSettle came to the fore, and it was only when we were very much into eSettle and, and when it got into its test phase, it became clear that that wasn't going to deliver um, what we needed. But there's a suggestion in the submission, which you provided uh, helpfully for the committee, that actually what was happening was that the, 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 the project board was, was being bypassed and that issues were coming straight to the, the main board of the organisation. Not to the main board. It would have gone up within the, the partnership and change group and to, the, and to some extent to the partnership board and to different groupings. I mean, Katrina has led a, a review of governance uh, going forward as we learn the lessons from the past and has uh, put, brought in new arrangements to, uh, that are now in place and are operating and will cover all our projects, whether they be IT-related or business-related, once BT has departed. Katrina. Helpful to hear a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. Yes, in terms of uh, improving um, governance with, uh, in the partnership, uh, we started to put changes in place um, really as long ago as 2010, once eSettle was um, uh, halted. And so over the last two-year period, um, we have much better project planning, execution and uh, oversight. And in that, we are helped by building up our own um, IT um, expertise, which clearly makes that uh, process much more um, effective. As uh, Sheena's already mentioned, there's now much better financial transparency uh, within uh, projects. And most importantly of all, there's much better oversight by the board and senior managers. Um, Ros, in the past, I think, expected um, innovative IT to, to give business benefits to RAWS, but we you know we have realized that, that was that was the wrong approach and that IT has to has to align to Ros's strategic aims going forward. So the board and senior managers have regular uh, oversight of uh, the IT program as Sheena said, um, governance of IT projects now escalates via me as the accountable officer to the board. Uh, I think it's also of note that within the last two years, we've developed a key risk register mm -hmm. that is looked at both by senior managers uh, and the board of ROS on a monthly basis, and that includes all uh, our uh, IT risks going forward forward. So, for example, on that register, we are monitoring um, the transition back to, uh, to, to ROSE and we will be, you know, adding in risks that relate to all our future uh, programme of work. 
Okay, thanks. <coughs> Ms Scanlon. Thank you. <coughs> Can I just first of all ask you, what is your view of this Audit Scotland report? Do you think it's fair and do you think it's accurate? I welcome the report. I, I think it's fair. I think it's accurate. Um, we did express our concerns to Audit Scotland about the scope of the report because we felt it would have been more helpful both to the committee and to the wider public sector had they looked at a broader range of um, IT uh, relationships and contracts, etc., and actually found examples of good practice so people would know what good practice looks like. But um, in, in terms of what it is, you know, we think it's a useful report. I, I think what we found is something that's very worrying indeed, given your responsibilities for tax collection in future. Would you also agree that the higher the collection rates are, the higher uh, the amount of money that's written off in IT contracts, the less revenue there is for governments to spend on essential public services? Well, of course, obviously, if, if money right. is wasted, and that's certainly something we want to avoid right. and will avoid, and we have actually now have a, a very good example of where we have, have done mm. that. We have obviously taken on responsibility for the crofting register, and we did that out with the scope of the strategic partnership agreement. Um, having failed to agree, agree, reach agreement with BT, who they had costs of in the region of one to two million for developing the crofting register, we went out to tender and have actually delivered the Crofting Register ahead of schedule, because obviously it goes live on the 30th of November, for £600,000. And that's obviously been a considerable saving for the Scottish Government, because as they have been funding the development of It's a considerable that. saving against a background of tens of millions of pounds of loss. Well, um, no, so can sorry, I just address sorry, it's not tens of millions of pounds of loss. There's two projects were written really? off, totalling less than £7 million. Obviously, the, the money that's been spent overall has kept the services running, kept all our IT telephones and everything running for eight years. Right. Before I come to my substantive, uh, substantive question, can you tell me what the level of compensation is to BT? In the report, it says it's currently being negotiated. How much are BT receiving in compensation from well, taxpayers' money? They, well, they... they, they, they we will be paying, obviously, all the inescapable costs that we're contractually liable to, play, to pay. Um, some of that will be in relation to, to TUPI, to third-party contracts, and also to um, the, the, the so-called compensation el element, um, which we've made provision for the total amount to be £2 million within the, our current accounts that have just been laid before Parliament. We expect it to be less than that. Another £2 million. OK. Can I just uh, go... go uh lead up to the main question I want to ask. Um, the, the two projects cancelled. Scottish Government unable to provide all the advice and support that was sought. The business case and benefits were not clearly defined. The governance arrangements were not effective. There were weaknesses in financial control, insufficient in-house specialist skills and experience to deliver ICT. Government provided limited support. A six-year gap between the reviews to highlight and address any difficulties, 400 changes, and uh, currently no mechanism to ensure that lessons are passed on. I take that from paragraph 70. Now, when I came along here today, and one of the reasons that we asked you to come along was the scale of the losses, the fact that you will be a tax collector. But when I came along today, I actually hoped to hear a bit more of addressing these points, but the minute the convener asked the question, first of all, we got it was all BT's fault. And uh, given that BT have no right of reply, I'm actually quite concerned at the points you make in paragraph 16 of your own submission on page four. Uh, partnership contract is extremely difficult to make work in an environment where two parties of fundamental different motivations. BT is there to maximise profits, while Ross wants a good service at a reasonable price. That is a very, very critical point against a major organisation who have no right to reply on this committee. And prior to that, uh, you actually say that partnership arrangements uh, was fundamentally unsuited for a public body. Now, this government and any other governance works with the private sector, and I actually feel coming along this morning, rather than giving me the confidence that you've learned the lessons 
and you're moving forward, to me, you're blaming all of these issues and problems on a private company who have no right to reply. Is that fair? It wouldn't be fair, and that's not what I have done. I have not said I have blamed BT. I've said I thought the contract was uh, was inappropriate, I think, in, in terms of its scale, its extent. I mean, we work in partnership with a whole range of bodies, but what was the wrong thing for Ross was to go with one single supplier for everything for a long period of time with a contract that did little in the way either to ensure speedy delivery or good value for money. The comments about uh, partnership and in terms of the motivations comes from Gartner, which obviously is an international um, consultancy who are regarded as world experts. That was their assessment of it. That's not my assessment, though I wouldn't disagree with it. Uh, we have learned our, our lessons from this. We, as Katrina has said, we have put in new arrangements on government. We have firm delegated budgeting right across the business now. We have brought in our own ex experts, uh, in Ian and his team. Uh, in terms of tax collection, we are already collecting stamp duty land tax for HMRC. That has worked well. That is done through our automated registration of, of title. Uh, service, which obviously was a, one of the successful results of the partnership. So I do think that we can give the committee assurance uh, about what we've been doing. You mentioned the, the number of CCNs. I'll just maybe ask my colleague Ian to, to comment on that. Yeah. The, um, the, the, this number of 400 has been brought up, and I think at your last meeting, um, Ian Gray pointed out that, that the reason it was in the Audit Scotland report was it was highlighted in one of our own internal uh, audit reports. Now, the, uh, that number is is not a helpful number. It does not indicate anything of any uh, of a, in any material sense. I think uh, I think uh, actually uh, the auditor and one of our colleagues at the meeting previously pointed out to you that 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 num uh, that number is a number of change control notices. Now, the contract bound the registers of Scotland to use a change control mechanism for essentially any change, barring forgotten passwords and the like. Yeah, but barring those kind of trivial issues, all other issues had to be addressed through a change control notice. Now, the change control notice, just to avoid any doubt here, was not changing the nature of the contract. In some instances, a few, a handful of instances, it was used to change the nature of the contract. But in 99.99% of the case, uh, like four, uh, 396 of them, let's say, it was used for small changes, small modifications, locations of equipment or small upgrades, small modifications in the behaviour of a system, uh, improvements in its usability, uh, changes as a result of changes in legislation and, and fee orders, everything, uh, uh, buying of new equipment, this was all covered. Every single one of these activities, of a normal, normal activities of an organisation were covered by a CCN. And that number is, is, a, is of no use to us in measuring any adequacy or any problems in the relationship. Now, it's, um, um, it was the internal audit reports I've seen of our, of our predecessors, my feeling is that that number was brought up internally because of the, the clumsiness of operation of change control notices. Our organisation was suffering because of the administrative load and just general eviscerating effect of having to generate one of these change control notices for relatively minor uh, elements of our day-to-day -day existence. And so internally we were not happy with that aspect and I think that was one of the reasons that that number was used because that projected into the readers' minds, I readers within the organisation, the amount of hassle and effort, the treacle through which we had to, or the organisation had to wade at the time to get anything done. So that's what that number indicates. It's, it's not. It, uh, there were some interpretations made of it at the last meeting, which I don't think were helpful. Well, we can we can only read from what is in the Audit Scotland report. I did ask if you thought it was fair and it was accurate, and uh, Miss Adams did say that it was. So we are not experts. We are here to ensure that we scrutinise what Audit Scotland says and how taxpayers' money is spent and indeed wasted. My final question, because I know lots of others would want to come in, I still feel that you're unduly blaming your other partner in the contract. You were an equal partner in signing and agreeing to the terms and conditions of that contract. So <laughs> if the contract five, ten years down the line didn't suit you, it was equally your contract. So is it right, is it fair, and is it justifiable 
that you blame what was in a contract that you fully, openly, honestly and transparently agreed to with BT. Is it fair, <laughs> you know, if the contract doesn't work out in your favour, that you blame a contract that you have agreed to and indeed blame a company who have no right of reply here today? Do you want to? I think the Keeper has made it patently clear that we are not blaming uh, BT. You asked, would it be fair? It, 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 would, be un it would be unfair. Quoted. Were we doing that? We did not do that. You, yes, it's quoting yes. Gartner, which is a consultancy who came to quoted. the conclusion that the, 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 uh, the alignment was not good. BT's interests did not match those of Ross in a way that would re produce value for money. That, that was their quote. It's, it's, it's actually, it's, it's in italics in that paragraph to indicate the fact it is a quote from I Gartner. I understand italics. I, yeah, do, the keeper, I am well, aware the of the difference. It, the Keeper made it clear that we are not blaming them. I don't, I don't see how she could have made it any more clear than that. Uh, paragraph 14, which is not in italics, Mr Campbell. Yeah. Ross now believes that partnership arrangement was fundly, fundamentally unsuitable for a public body. Some of the reasons for that view are set out below. And please don't insult me on a committee. I'm sure my colleague didn't in, in, in any way intend to insult you. Um, we just obviously want to try to clarify our position. As I said, you know, we are not blaming BT. We, what we, we think as a management team now, who were not around at the time, and obviously the world has moved on considerably, is that it was the wrong type of contract for, BT, uh, for registers of Scotland. Uh, and we did not have... It, either I think at the time or subsequently uh, sufficiently skilled and exper expert staff who would have been able to make good use of it if it had been able to work but we do feel that the fundamental issue is the nature of the contract. Uh, our new IT strategy um, means that we will be delivering our IT through a mixture of in-house ex experts uh, working with small and medium enterprises who will obviously be I hope, keen to work for us, exactly the company who uh, John has worked with in terms of the crofting register that has gone very, very well. Um, uh, no way are we criticising BT in the same way we wouldn't expect BT to be at any public forum criticising us. We have, as I've said earlier, we have had successes in the partnership. The delivery of Artel was one, though obviously it had its problems, and we have successfully been able to deliver services to our customers right across Scotland over the whole period of the partnership, and we are now undertaking our registration work more quickly, more accurately, and with a lot fewer arrears than there has ever been in the past, and have continued to have very high levels of customer satisfaction, and we have very good relationships with our customers. Mr Scott. Uh, thank you. I'm, I'm intrigued by this uh, argument, which has in many ways gone full circle now over 15 years of devolution, that we're better to procure these services by a combination of in-house um, IT, which you've just described, Keeper, and uh, small organisations. Is that the, now the logical position you'd take in the context, I think, in that you mentioned in your submission, the wider Scottish Government IT strategy and various working boards and groups and so on and so forth? Is that the approach you now take and advise some um, Scottish Government on as well? take in terms of our organisation and, and our business needs. Obviously, we're a very specialist user of IT services. We're the only land register uh, organisation in Scotland. Uh, and obviously, where it's appropriate for us to share with other parts of the, of the public sector, we'll do that. We will obviously feed our views in. As I say, both Katrina and Ian are contributing to that. Ian, would you like to just say your yeah, professional uh, view? Yeah, my professional view is that uh, I find it difficult to believe how a, a large organisation can, many, many times larger than a small fry organisation like the Registers of Scotland, how a large organisation could possibly be aligned. How could it ever be aligned? It, we are trying to do something. We are, we're just one of the many uh, clients of a large organisation, as would any other agency be. And in any relationship, when one partner is bigger than the other, it's, it's not a good starting point. It's not a good starting point in personal relationships. It's not a good starting point in business relationships. Yeah, there should be equality in it, or at least uh, a, a complementary nature in the skills and experience of two organisations. We are switching, where possible, to using smaller organisations. Smaller organisations will jump through the fieriest of hoops for a larger organisation. We're, we're a public body. We have public money to spend. The private sector lines up to get public money. Private sector thinks that public money is easy money. Small companies, are, it's much harder for small companies to exercise control over a public body than it is for a larger organisation. The trust 
in, in, personally, my trust lies with small organisations much more than larger organisations. So okay. I think small organisations. Yeah, I think we get the point. I mean, the the um, but the principles you presumably accept, given your professional expertise in IT, are the same no matter what kind of IT, uh, no matter what kind of business yours is, as opposed to the health service or as opposed to some other part of the of the public sector. Bearing in mind this is the audit committee responsible for looking at the audit of public money. We're constantly told the principles are the same in terms of the provision in the public sector for services. Now you've just said that your approach to providing IT services are demonstrably different from any other part of the Scottish Public Service. Would you accept that? I think the other parts of the public sector will be taking a mixed approach, and I think that was recognised in uh, the McClelland report on the procurement of IT. I, don't think that's true. I think the other parts of the public sector are being told to procure on a big, big, wide Scotland uh, arrangement with big providers, with big companies I, that you've just criticised. I think, because... I think sometimes that, that works. I mean, it depends what you're doing. I mean, obviously, I would expect to... Um, work with the rest of the public sector in accessing, you know, access to the internet, perhaps desktop supplies, all those kind of things. I think it has to be horses for courses. Katrina, do you want to add anything? You've been yeah, involved yeah, I mean, in I think obviously the, the, when it's a big contract for um, infrastructure, then you probably are looking at larger no, I'm providers. I'm just talking IT. about IT. Yeah, OK. Um, no. I, well, I think it probably is... Um, mixed um, if you're looking at provision of broadband services. I mean, clearly you're, you're, you're then looking at larger suppliers. I think um, the problem for Rose was that we really did put all our eggs into the one basket with the partnership. They provided all of our services. So there was a bit of a kind of straitjacket. You couldn't pick and choose and say, well, we'll go somewhere else. Um, to get this bit of our um, IT, they provided everything, they kept the lights uh, going and they provided all our IT development. Um, and it, for uh, an organisation like Rose, obviously a, a public uh, organisation which has evolved a lot over the, over the last eight years, that simply didn't, didn't work. Obviously life has uh, changed and one of the one of the things highlighted in the many reports we have obtained is that the length uh, of the contract itself was really one of, of, the, of the main um, uh, areas because a public body now would not really expect to go out uh, and get a huge one-stop <coughs> service for bespoke um, Software um, IT, you would you would you would you would you would now be looking at much more um, generic services. Um, obviously, I'm not a you know IT expert, but I I I I do think that that whole that whole ethos has uh, changed. When we entered into the partnership, that was the name of the game. We had big bespoke registration services. And for that, we needed a big supplier who would provide everything uh, for us. And we expected, I think, as I said earlier, that um, just having um, innovative IT would somehow change how Rose worked. And that was a fundamental error, in my view. As I say, I've only been here in the last three years, but I think that's... That's what happened. I mean, I think you're right, but but it's not the way government procurement's going. So I'm just intrigued to see a very clear difference between your approach as part of the public sector. I take it. The, I take your point. You're not um, uh, directly a government body. You're you're part of the public administration of Scotland, not a not a directly a ministerial body. But you're taking a different approach to IT procurement than the one that we're constantly told is the right way to go for Scotland. And I think all I'm asking is that in evidence to us, you can demonstrate. I mean, I take your point about the Crofters thing. You were able to you, the register. You were able to to uh, procure that as. 600,000 as opposed to higher cost. Um, but uh, I think the audit committee would need evidence that your approach, the approach you've now taken as an organisation, is demonstrably going to provide savings to the public sector in a, in a, in a procurement manner, which is quite different to the one that we're offered every, from, frankly, any other chief exec or keeper who comes along to talk to us. The assessment, for example, going forward in terms of our taking the approach that we're taking is that we expect to have at least 30% savings on the service costs of our IT provision each year going forward. Uh, that is a 
a reasonable estimate. We hope to achieve uh, more than that, and we certainly hope to have savings on development, as uh, obviously I've uh, mentioned in terms of the crofting register. Uh, I mean, we're taking this approach because we want to get it right. We've learned the lessons, and clearly don't want to be sitting in front no, of agree. you, no, you know, in future. Can I ask one final question, convener, uh, and I, I totally appreciate that. Totally appreciate that. One final question. Um, the first time, or one of the times this came to us before, uh, there was some fairly serious questions about the role of your auditors, your external auditors. Auditors and the way in which they have, they had, uh, uh, well, frankly, not discovered what was going on. Have you changed your auditors, your external auditors, since uh, yes, since that? Yes, the contract with Grant Thornton uh, ended, and Audit Scotland has has now come in as our external auditors because of our, we have obviously PwC as our internal auditors, and we've had. Um, contractual relationships with other people who are on the Audit Scotland list. Um, Audit Scotland then, by default, had to come back to be our external auditors. But your internal auditors are still the same as they were at the time this all happened? Uh, we've been working very closely with our, our internal auditors. They've been very helpful in, in helping us as a management team to look at these issues. That was one of, um, the, one's of, one of the finals, the sort of findings of the Audit mm, Scotland report. The internal auditors missed this. Well, obviously, I mean... I mean so I'm just it, asking, yeah, you'd have entirely justified in changing your internal auditors as well, wouldn't you? Uh, well, we're... I think that I mean, the, obviously the, the, the extent of the problems with the partnership only really came to light when eSettle um, was of, when we had assessed that it was going to fail, and that was in 2010. Sure. So there wasn't really anything to miss. I mean, obviously they were aware of, the, of all the actions that we had taken over Artel, for example, but um, our current internal audit arrangements are out to tender. Um, obviously, our audit committee is entirely non-executive, yeah, no, uh, and they've all been very helpful in working with the management team to, to, to make sure that the lessons have been learned and that we have new systems and procedures in place going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Beattie. Thank you, uh, I've got several questions. I'd, I'd like to start looking a little bit more about this uh, question of the in-house uh, capability. Um, is it actually cost? I mean, this goes against the trend generally in the private sector, where where te technical capabilities tend to be, for the most part, uh, contracted out, except for those that are uh, uh, for maintenance of legacy systems and so on. And you seem to be indicating, and correct me if I'm wrong, that uh, the in-house IT capability will be used for procurement as well. Now. It seems to me maybe this is a bit of a knee-jerk reaction to the experience that you've had with BT, and you seem to be saying that you're focusing on smaller companies or smaller uh, IT providers. Uh, and I would ask, do you have a due diligence process for these small providers? Uh, again, the, you know, I have considerable experience in IT procurement, and there has never been any evidence that I've seen that small providers versus large providers uh, place you at a, an advantage or a disadvantage, except if they have a highly specialised uh, capability. So I'm interested to know how you how you handle that. Well, obviously, uh, for example, in the crofting register, we use the Scottish Government framework arrangements. I mean, we work very closely with the Scottish Government Procurement uh, Directorate. Uh, obviously, we have our own procurement team, and they have actually got the superior rating and have just yet again improved. Um, so the mixture that we'll be using is a small team of internal experts, who some of whom will be doing development work themselves, and others, a mixture, will be working with uh, the contractors that we're using. Some of these um, small companies that we'll be using will actually be the third party uh, contracts that will come over to us at the end of the, the BT contract. These are actually companies that BT have been using um, to do some of, of the work, uh, particularly in terms of um, maintaining uh, service. Obviously, some BT staff will come over as well. Ian, do you want to yeah, add extra uh, bleeding uh, on this? Yes, yeah, you made a number of points there. Correct me if I don't cover them all, please. Um, uh, as Sheena said, uh, at the end of this contract, the two pay the transfer undertakings protection of employment legislation uh, uh, mandates that we take on, or the new provider of the service takes on the staff who are currently providing the service. So that day-to-day um, -day service provision, provision comes to us anyway. Yep. So that, that's we're getting it anyway. So uh, and for that ongoing, essentially, uh, I don't want to belittle it, but that's, I'll just use the word commodity service. Uh, is one that will be in-house because it has to be transferred to somewhere. And by transferring it in-house, uh, we believe we'll have much more control over it. And I'll return to that in a second, uh, why that we think that's important. The, uh, the other aspect is uh, the in-house experts that we're uh, a team, expert team we're developing or building is about development and design, design development of new systems. Um, 
Although, Sheena said, a lot has been done over the last 78 years within the partnership, the, the, the Registers of Scotland, in my opinion, when I joined it a year and a bit ago, it's, it's a coiled spring of business process improvement. Um, John King's registration department, who are 900 of our 1,000 uh, headcount, they are absolutely desperate to, to, uh, a, a, to, uh, to, to perform business uh, process improvements. They're doing it anyway, but they're struggling with the IT. And the nature of the contract, the nature of the contract and the arrangements in it, made it very difficult for us, to, uh, for his his department, to change and to do new things to improve their processes. So, we have a lot of catching up to do, in my opinion, uh, in terms of uh, in terms of the degree to which we can be efficient and improve our business process. So, we need to take control of that. And handing that out would be fine if it was business as usual, but it is not business as usual. We are catching up, we're going through significant improvements, and that needs tighter control, and it needs finer grained control than one would get if one were to have a contractual arrangement with an external party. Um, as I think Sheena said, we're going to be using the normal uh, Scottish Government frameworks to uh, to get the suppliers for the, small, uh, the, the smaller pieces of work. Now, I'm going to try and answer your question, but one could discuss endlessly whether small small versus large companies and how suitable they are for various uh, 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 various uh, activities. But instead of talking about small, large companies, I'd actually rather talk about small or large granules of work. One of the lessons we feel <coughs> that I've learned during this, this contract is doing large granule, of, a single large granule over <coughs> excuse me eight years to do so much for this organisation was fatally flawed. In that you can't control, and also it is delusional to think at the start of such a project, uh, one would know what is required later on. Even halfway along that time scale, it's impossible. Delusional to think that. Business environments change, regulatory environments change, legislative environments change, people change, fashions change. Everything changes during that period, and so it has to be smaller granules. Now, I think Tavish was, I think Tavish was hint, uh, Scott was a hint, uh, heading in the direction of of asking big versus small contracts rather than necessarily big or small providers. <clears throat> There's a risk view one can take. If one takes a big granule, one is committed. One puts on the frown of sincerity, <clears throat> writes the spec, and forward chaps, off we go, you know, to oblivion, most likely. Whereas if one has small granules, the, 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 the monetary investment in those, sm those small granules is smaller. The emotional investment in those, in those granules is smaller. The career and, prof <clears throat> and professional... Um, uh, the, the career uh, investments of individuals in those granules is smaller. So when, when those granules fail, and they will, that is the no, that's the normal course of human existence. Those granules will fail. Those parts will fail. When they fail, it's easier to say, hmm, that was a failure. Let's push that to the side. Let's do something different. Let's replace it with something else. We've lost very little time because it was a small granule. We've, we've lost very little money because it was a small granule. And none of us have lost face because it was a small granule. Yeah. So I think... Behaviourally, psychologically, financially, risk, and just general risk management, it is a much better solution. Well, obviously, well, yeah. we need to keep questions and answers Sorry. a little more succinct, okay. <laughs> Mr. BT. Uh, uh, okay, uh, can I ask, uh, what is the definition of an intelligent client? Well, someone who actually uh, has a, pro a professional background in, in the subject that they're looking at, who has ex wide range of experience in different types of, of settings, and who's kept themselves up to date with their professional knowledge. Uh, obviously, I mean, we look to solicitors to do that, we look to doctors, we look to accountants, uh, and obviously that's what we're now trying to do with our IT function, actually have staff who are professionally qualified and have experience, because that is something that was seriously lacking in Registers of Scotland previously. Uh, within that definition, though, an intelligent client is not necessarily just an IT person. It's a user. Yes, that, obviously the users have to have um, an understanding of it, and that's something we're working with Ian's team on to obviously improve our ability to, mm -hmm. to understand the intelligence around IT um, issues as, as you know, senior managers within the public <laughs> sector, because I think that's something we're never really... You know, I think very few of us ever get... You don't go to a training course that makes you an intelligent customer. Uh, it's something you kind of gain through experience and through working with your, your colleagues. Can I add something to that? Uh, I'll, I'll keep it short this time. Um, it's not just IT skills. It's hard-nosed business skills that are required. Public sector is not very good at hard-nosed business skills. The hard-nosed business skills are on the other side of the table normally. Again, the larger the company, the more powerful, the more slick, 
the more polished they are at those hard-nosed business skills. Yeah. I do, I do think you've had your fingers burned and you're reacting to that. But uh, one last question. Um, one thing that one comment that was made was that uh, when the supplier, presumably BT, uh, had a problem, they would go straight to senior management and bypass the team on the ground that was actually supposedly managing the project. How would senior management think that that was the right process to be followed? Um, obviously that doesn't happen now and it hasn't happened in, in the yeah. time when we have been leading on that. Um, I, I think a lot of it was to do with the relationships that had built up and that the, the senior managers yeah. previously in Register of Scotland had worked for quite a lot of time with the, the, their counterparts in, in the supplier and people just used that kind of business relationship. Um, just to come back to what you were saying and obviously to, uh, to reassure Mrs Scanlon as well is that you know we are not saying this is BT. We will have an ongoing business relationship with BT as obviously they will continue to provide support for the specially written software uh, that you know, has been being used during the partnership and will continue to be used for uh, a period. So uh, we will have a relationship with a big supplier as well as a range of, of smaller suppliers. Yes, thanks, Ms. White. Uh, thank you very much, much convener, and good morning. Uh, having listened to, obviously, what's been said, it appears to be that the original contract, which was eight years ago drawn up, seems to be the nub of the problems which uh, ROS has faced. Uh, you can give me a straight yes or no answer to, uh, to that. And I know you went about at that particular time, but in that contract, was were staff and management involved with the, you know, basically the day-to-day -day running of it? Uh, it seems to be in 2004, if you're writing up an eight-year contract, it's something certainly that... I wouldn't have done, and I don't think I was looking for insurance or something like that. You'd be looking for a bidder after every three or four years. So I just wanted to confirm that in 2004, when the contract was written up, the problems basically lie in that particular way the contract was written up. That is our assessment as the management team of today, yes. Okay. Thank you, sir. Just, just to basically get to that particular point, can I ask now what perhaps lessons have been learned from yourselves? Uh, what has been put in place regarding the skills and the management and the culture of ROS at the moment? Uh, basically, I'll, I'll throw that one to yourselves now. Uh, I think there's a whole range of things has been done. Um, obviously, we have revisited our governance structures. As Katrina said, she led on that work. We have new governance arrangements in place where the future programmes will be directly accountable to Katrina as accountable officer and not to a kind of hybrid committee made up of the supplier and the business. Uh, we've also done training uh, for our staff on uh, managing projects, we've refresher training for those who have qualifications and um, you know, training for, for people who haven't perhaps had training before, including for ourselves as senior responsible or, or um, officers within projects and programmes. Uh, as mentioned earlier, we have delegated budgeting in in terms of staff with skills and experience, obviously we have brought in Ian, and he had a, was a predecessor um, who came in and, and slightly before that as well, but who, who left, uh, who was professionally qualified and had a range of experience. Ian has brought in a team of staff with small team with you know, real qualifications, experience and know-how. Uh, we've just appointed, uh, unfortunately we lost our finance director, she um, left to pursue an academic career and we have a new finance director who has experience of managing uh, and being involved in the financial control of major programmes within the public sector of investment in IT. Uh, we have, in terms of our legal services people now, we have obviously Katrina and uh, our legal services directorate who are primarily staff who are on secondment from Scottish Government Legal Directorate and who have the, you know, the skills to help us uh, and work with our external legal advisors at looking at commercial arrangements. So there's a whole range of things that we've done and obviously we have a new uh, ICT strategy, as I've said, which is focusing on uh, how, we, you know, how we develop our IT going forward mm -hmm. and making sure that we do it in manageable chunks that provide good value uh, and obviously we'll be continuing to work with our stakeholders in that. We have a stake stakeholder forum that we meet with regularly and we've shared our views and our thinking on this going forward with them as well. Uh, Convene, I'm, I'm quite happy with the, the answer. I think we've answered all the questions I wanted to ask, so I'm happy with that. Thanks very much. Mr Coffey. Thanks very much, Convener, and good morning. Um, 
I mean, I've got some experience in the software engineering side as well, and project management and specification and so on. And, and, and listening to this story kind of reminds me of some of the, the fatal mistakes that have been made in that in that sector over a long number of years. Um, if you go into no, by me, no, no, no. <laughs> oh, by others. I mean, if you go into an electrical shop, right, and you you don't really fully articulate what it is you want, you're likely to come out with a tumble driver when you really wanted a washing machine. So, I mean, I don't know if that daft analogy is, is relevant here, but it sounds kind of like that story. Where in the early days, the requirements that, that the organisation needed just weren't capable of being articulated by the, the staff that were within, within the organisation. And that's not to, to, to blame BT. BT is the, the vendor probably did their best to try to help the organisation along its way to understanding what its requirements actually were. And that's a common fault that you see convener in, in IT procurement projects over the years. So I, I think that's probably at the root cause of this. But really for me too and for the, the members of the committee, I think they'll be wondering why on earth it took such a while for that to dawn on anybody <laughs> and for some kind of earlier intervention to to you know to, to be put in place to try to correct it, rescue it or otherwise. So uh, I suppose I think I'm kinda of wondering about what you know, does the organisation now, do you guys are you giving us the impression that you fully understand what went wrong and that you've put proper steps in place to, to, to make sure that this doesn't happen again. The, the role about the intelligent client was mentioned there. Now, at no time should the vendor or end become the intelligent client. You're the client. So you should be telling the vendor what you need. And, and if you're not able to do that, you get somebody in, but not somebody from the vendor. <laughs> It's a bit like asking a car salesman to sell you a car in a sense convener as well. Uh, so uh, the other point that I think that caused a bit of discussion there, convener, was that this change request thing and Mr Campbell offered an explanation. In most of these software development projects, you can get thousands of change requests. So I don't think that's really a, a big issue, although it was highlighted in the Audit Scotland report. It's not really a big issue. The main issue is the failure to articulate requirements at an early stage. And there's a common thread there, convener, isn't there, in some of the work that the audit committee has done over the years. So what I'm looking for you from you is some kind of sense that you fully understand what happened and that systems and people are in place in the organisation to make sure that this is corrected and doesn't happen again. Well, I think that, I mean, that is exactly our assessment of, of what was wrong in that we did not have uh, the access to the expert advice and the knowledge of how systems work. I mean, since, you know, it, it has been Ian's arrival and the arrival of, of his team that he's brought in that has enabled us to make the decision to terminate the contract of, of the partnership early and to get out two years in advance um, because we understand the, um, the, the technical nature and some of the technical issues that are, um, that are around that we obviously were not in a position to, uh, to, to understand or to even think about um, before uh, so that has been a you know a huge difference for us and obviously the, the, you know, the two-year early departure will save something like three million a year in terms of service costs um, and obviously we have now demonstrated that we're able to develop and deliver IT projects well um, obviously John has been working on the crofting register and was involved in working with the supplier John do you maybe just want to say a few words about how that went yeah, I mean, it very much echoes your sentiment. I mean, one of the key issues I've experienced from a, an operational management role in terms of um, any new IT is around requirements. And the great benefit I've seen, particularly with crofting, is um, the intelligent client function role, which Ian's team have provided, which is essentially taking an operational requirement, putting some technical language around it, and then interacting and discussing what our requirements are uh, in a way in which an IT company can understand. and. I would emphasise with crofting, it was a highly complex piece of IT. Um, it's um, not unlike the land register, so you have this very large spatial element to it, you have a textual element to it, then you have a public facing element to it. So unlike, for instance, a, an SDLT system or a future LBTT system, it's a, a much more complex piece of work. And the company informed solutions, they um, started work in March of this year and the registers now you know, it's, it's ready um, and it will support the commencement of the crofting legislation later this year. And a lot of the 
one of the big reasons why we have been able to deliver that in a short period of time is having a, an intelligent client, fun client function, which can help us work more effectively with a, a particular IT company. Mm, convener, I know we're of time. That, that's more encouraging than what I've, I've heard and what I've read in the, the report. I mean, before you, you, you get a piece of software running for your organisation, it's really dangerous to commission it on a, pr on a promise of what it will do. You really have to see it working and, and functioning if you can at some stage, either by another client who's bought the same thing, or to commission it in stages, as Mr Campbell, I think, was referring to there. So, I mean, I haven't heard software granularity for a wee while, but that, that's that's really a step, and it's a wise step, I think, to, to bring back into this business, I think. Thanks, Okay, thanks. thanks. I think it's, Scanlon's got a it's quick, just a very quick sh follow up on supplementary that point. to Colin Beatty and um, uh, Willie Covey's point. Uh, on, on the intelligent cl uh, client, and, and I think it's a very critical point. Uh, but if we look at page six, uh, the key messages in this Audit Scotland report, uh, whilst you may not uh, be an intelligent client or lived up to that expectations, we cannot question the intelligent client status of the Scottish Government. Because the Scottish Government was unable to provide three public bodies with all the advice and support that they sought. So... You know, what we're looking for here is how things can be done better in future. Your capability to collect the stamp duty tax in 2015, you may not have all the expertise there, but the Scottish Government, when you asked for help, according to Audit Scotland, that help was not there. Do you feel that, given your experience, I want to move forward positively, that that intelligent client, that additional support should be in the Scottish Government. Sorry. Um, I, I think we need a kind of a dual approach mas myself. I think we want our own intelligent client function who understands our business in-house, and we would very much welcome for there to be able to work with colleagues in Scottish Government so as they can bounce ideas off each other, so as that the Scottish Government can act as... And, I think Mary's question is, are you getting that now? where it would appear that in the past it wasn't there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you feel you're getting that yeah. now? Katrina? I think, I think certainly since the uh, e-settle failure, we have had a very regular dialogue with SG, and that's obviously covered finance, procurement and legal um, issues. Uh, I think, as uh, Sheena said, Rose, as a uh, um, NMD, um, was aware that we had to rebuild our own IT um, expertise and to put our own house in uh, order. So I don't think there was any assumption that um, IT staff, per se, would come from um, SG. But in all other overarching aspects of uh, the partnership, we have been having very regular dialogue with them. And we clearly had... Um, help from ISIS in arranging the post-project reviews for the two failed uh, projects, and that was really excellent work. It really was excellent work, very useful. And we've also had a uh, dialogue with the Centre for Excellence on the two delayed uh, gateway reviews. So we have a kind of, we'll have a, a kind of regular uh, dialogue in uh, these areas, and as um, we have said, we have we're, we're we're now using some of our, our new expertise to uh, feed into the central government uh, IT strategy and and and, and kind of their uh, thoughts, and of course we're working with them on um, LBTT. Okay, thanks, Mr. Dornan. Thank you, Convener. Um, Good morning. Uh, while I, I recognise that the, the core of the problem may well be the contract that was, that was written a long time ago, and clearly I have some sympathy with the imbalance with a much larger partner over a period of time, uh, that doesn't really explain, as far as I can see, the page 11, paragraphs 30 and 31, when they talk about the individual projects lacking detailed costs, benefits and milestones and also no progress updates on the programme as a whole being provided to the board. Yeah. Can you explain to me why that happened? And B, can you assure me that you've got uh, changes in place to make sure it doesn't happen in the future? Certainly. In terms of the, the kind of costs and benefits, there was no delegated budgeting in place in Registers of Scotland until I became Keeper and uh, got the new finance director to bring that in. So there was not 
um, accountability <coughs> for um, expenditure on individual projects by the project manager. People thought it was quite acceptable just to, to get more money and keep spending because the business case process that was in place at the time uh, looked at the original project and then did a business case for any changes to the project or any add-ons without relating it back to the main business case. That has been changed. A new business case system uh, has been brought in and has been closely overseen by the Finance Directorate rather than within the Information Directorate in the way it had been in the past. Um, the governance issues I, I, I mentioned about the, the problems of the government's arrangements set out in the contract, that has been completely changed. The government's arrangements that are in place now are clearly within the management structure within Registers of Scotland with all programmes and projects having a line straight up to Katrina as accountable officer. So yes, I could assure the committee that those we identified these issues and we have made the changes necessary to make sure that the same types of issues don't happen again. We've also brought in, uh, brought in um, benefits realisation um, actions within projects so that we have a clear expectation of what the projects are supposed to deliver and we'll be measuring that throughout the projects. That's being used, for, for example, at the moment in the transition project that's bringing back a control from BT to ROS uh, and that is clearly um, working. Uh, Katrina chairs that project board on a weekly basis and there's a regular update to the executive management team and uh, to the board when they meet and obviously it features on our risk register. So we have put all these things in place and are, are adhering to them very strictly. Thank you very much. Okay. That's very Mr. Dorn and Mr. Kerr. Uh, Thank you, convener, and good morning. Good morning. Um, I think my, probably my, most of my questions have been asked, but you're obviously having dialogue with the Scottish government uh, uh, agencies, but uh, one of the, th the things in the report, I just have to clarify, I'm sure you probably have done it in another way during your deposition, but the the fact that the findings of independent assurance reports, the gateway reports, uh, is mentioned in number paragraph 35 and page 12 and 42 to 43 brings up the same sort of thing. The information was brought forward by these reports, but quite frankly, weren't really acted on. Can we have a, some form of guarantee that more, uh, more credence is given to these independent reports? Or? I think the, the, there's an issue with gateway reports in that they are provided entirely to the, the SRO for the project. There is no requirement uh, under the whole kind of Prince project management process for those reports to be shared with the kind of wider management team. And one of the issues that we identified was that the postponed gateway five report on the overall partnership uh, you know, had been postponed by the SRO and there was no mechanism to tell either the, the chief executive or the accountable officer that that gateway had been postponed. Uh, we've made recommendations to the Scottish Government that that be changed and they have agreed to do that so there will be a clear visibility by both accountable officers and chief executives that gateway reviews have been um, you know, postponed uh, you know, for, for particular reasons. Um, in terms of our, how we operate ourselves now, the SROs who are receiving gateway reviews share these with their management team colleagues, so we're able, as an executive management team, to look at the issues that have been identified, you know, whether they be positive issues, negative issues, or amber issues that come out of the gateway reviews, and then we develop an action plan and monitor that uh, to make sure that we don't lose sight of the recommendations that come from gateway reviews. Mm -hmm. This seemed to be that it's, uh, there's been a, a management breakdown here. Yes. Quite severe one, uh, if we're being perfectly honest. Uh, and I think it sort of comes back to some of the things that have been said partially by the committee and partially in your own evidence. But if, you can, if you're saying to us that these management deficiencies have been cleared, there's a clear line of uh, communication not just between the Scottish Government yourself, your third party, but through your own organisation, then uh, I may well be able to see some way forward here. Yes. Just um, add something to that. Um, after the uh, e-settle uh, project was uh, uh, halted, we had the first uh, delayed gateway rev review, uh, and we implemented, so I was probably in post about... Uh, Six months or so, um, we started. We started looking at the uh, gateway review. So we had one uh, gateway review at the end of 2010. We followed up the recommendations f 
from that and echoing some of the earlier uh, questions that told us to work with um, in the partnership and see what value we could <coughs> extract from it. That we did, and we did improve some of our some of our. Uh, practices as a, a result of that. We then ran the Gateway Review again one year later when the conclusion of the Gateway Review was that we probably had extracted all the value we could get from the partnership in its uh, present form. And just by way of reassurance, once we have uh, completed the uh, transition of services back to Rose, we will be asking the Centre of uh, Excellence to work with us on uh, a state of readiness um, gateway, which I think is to take place sometime in the new year. So uh, since I've been here, we've certainly had three, you know, we're, 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 we're looking at sort of three gateway reviews over the entire programme. Yes, Mr. Coffey, very small. Thanks, Thank you, for bringing me back in. What I forgot to ask the guests, of course, is are you currently using any recognised project management or software development management systems to help you through your new processes? And if so, what, what are they? <coughs> I can answer that. Yeah, the, the PRINCE2 mechanism is the standard public sector and often a standard in large private sector organisations. It's, it's used throughout the business and it will also be used within IT. IT development hasn't actually started in full flow yet. We, we, we need BT techs at the building essentially uh, for, for that to start. There is a Wizard of Oz curtain between us and all of our IT and that doesn't that isn't revealed until the end of November and it's at that point that uh, uh, software development for real will start. There is There are some prototyping and some investigative work happening just now and you know to understand the, the lie of the land, etc. But uh, the, the real work starts on 1st of December and the standard methodologies will be used. In fact, some agile methodologies will be used as well. If that's, uh, when we set foot back in Kansas, will we yes. actually, be, <laughs> actually be using yes, Prince? Yes, precisely. Yeah. We'll be using Prince. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, amongst, amongst others, yes. Okay. Uh, thanks very much. And uh, I, 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 I just want to close with, with one question to try and get to the heart, I think, of what has been the main... Um, concern, I think, that's been expressed. On the 7th of November, we do have evidence from the Scottish Government around, not Ross particularly, but ICT contracts, but obviously the evidence you've given today is going to inform, I think, uh, the, the questions the committee asked the Scottish Government, and I suspect that we will come back to the general approach to ICT contracts, and Mr Scott, for example, has made the point that, that you've given very strong evidence of a view in Ross that what works for you is to work on smaller contracts with smaller companies. So my question to you is, are you saying that BT uh, is a, a, a company which is too big and too powerful for a public body like Ross ever to work with? I wouldn't say that at all. So we'll be continuing to work with BT and we'll have a contract with them in terms of their having to support our specially written software that they've created. Um, what we said was that the type... That's a legacy of the partnership. It is a legacy of the partnership, but I mean, our view is that the problem was the, the partnership contract in, in terms of how it tied us in and was for so long and for everything and did not have specific uh, and sufficient... Uh, mechanisms within it to ensure speedy value for money delivery. You also said there was an imbalance in power and expertise between yes. the client, yourselves, and the provider. But that was the nature of the contract, because the contract, the partnership okay. contract itself, was designed that the supplier uh, provide the intelligent client function, and I think that's a fundamental flaw in the contract. It would not be for me to to sit here and to to criticise and blame BT. Uh, our view is that it was the nature of the contract. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, we'll break for five minutes to allow a change of witnesses and just take a breather.
reconvene and check again that phones are off. I said, meaning he should. Uh, now we now move to item three uh, on our agenda, section 23 report from Audit Scotland, Scotland's Colleges, Current Finances, Future Challenges. Um, and welcome to uh, give evidence on this report, Caroline Gardner, the Auditor General, Ronnie Nicholl, who's the Assistant Director, and Graeme Greenhill, who's the Portfolio Manager for the Performance Audit Group at Audit Scotland. Uh, so welcome, and Auditor General, do you want to introduce the report? Thank you, Convener, I will. Um, the college sector has got a key role in supporting sustainable economic growth in Scotland uh, by contributing to the development of the high-level skills and education that we need for that. This report aims to summarise the financial standing of Scotland's incorporated college just before planned structural reforms come into effect um, and also public sector spending reductions have an impact on the sector. The report is largely based on college's 2010-11 financial statements and it establishes a position against which we hope to track future progress in terms of the reforms that are coming. Overall, the financial standing of the sector was generally sound in 2010-11, although the financial position of individual colleges does vary widely. Most colleges do operate to relatively tight financial margins and we didn't find any consistent trends in the amount of surplus or deficit reported by the sector as a whole over the last few years. In total, colleges spent £771 million in 2010-11 and received income of £742 million, resulting in an overall operating deficit for the sector of £29 million, so a very small operating deficit overall. Most of that deficit was due to the City of Glasgow College, which reported an operating deficit of £34 million for the year. That was associated with the redevelopment of the college's campus, and there are no underlying concerns about its financial health. Looking ahead, we know the sector does face considerable challenges. The Scottish Government revenue grant support for the sector is expected to fall to £471 million in 2014-15, the end of the current spending review period. This is a reduction of 24% in real terms. We think the sector may also face pressures from a range of increasing costs, such as demand for student places, um, buildings maintenance costs, and rising energy prices. Planned structural reform of the college sector will also um, create cost pressures. They do have the potential to bring a more strategic approach to management of the sector, including some savings from mergers and integration, and to bring more robust planning of education provision, which will have much wider benefits. But complex change on this scale will inevitably mean some disruption during the transition period, and there will be transitional costs for things like redundancy payments, relocation for staff, and the integration of administrative and other systems. It's too early to draw conclusions on the impact of the funding reductions and how well college mergers are being managed, but we do comment in the report on a number of risks that need to be managed during that period. First of all, the Scottish Government has set strategic objectives for post-16 education reform, but it hasn't yet published a quantified assessment of the overall costs of the structural changes to the sector and the expected benefits, and we think that would help to give a clearer picture of the affordability of the process ahead. Secondly, the new regional boards have an important role in providing leadership in the merger of college, colleges and the establishment of federations, and in supporting the complex change management that's needed. It's therefore important that they hit the ground running so that they can play that role, and also that they establish effective links early on with community planning partnerships and enable the strategic development of course planning provision. Finally, the outcome agreements that set out how colleges will contribute to the national objectives for, for education and learning need to develop further. At the moment, they concentrate largely on input measures, such as the volume of learning to be de delivered, and on process measures, such as the development of plans for structural change. But we think there's a real need to take them further now to look at the impact that, that the college sector should be having on uh, the wider um, education and learning agenda. The report makes a number of recommendations to the Scottish Government, the Scottish Funding Council and to colleges themselves about what needs to be done to implement the reform successfully. Convener, I'll stop there, but as always, the team and I are happy to answer questions from the committee. Okay, thanks very much. Um, I, can I start with uh, um, one of the key findings which you referred to, 
uh, there, Ms Gardner, that the overall financial standing of the college sector uh, in 2010-11 was, was generally sound. And I, I mean, on that basis, because that hasn't always been the case in the past, um, and although uh, the report does uh, make it clear that the financial standing of individual college colleges vary, there didn't seem to be in the report any alarm bells uh, being rung, and that also hasn't always been the case in the past. So is it fair to say that uh, in terms of where the college sector stands in this report, it, it's a generally positive finding that, that they are in a good, good place? It, it's certainly true that progress has been made over the last few years. You're absolutely right that there have been colleges that have faced significant financial problems in the past, um, and from the information available in their financial statements and from discussions with the Funding Council, it appears that none are in that position at the moment. Um, you'll see on page 11 of the report, Exhibit 4, which sets out the operating position for each of the colleges in Scotland. Um, most of them are, did deliver an operating surplus in 2010-11, um, and the, um, of those that uh, ended with an operating deficit, for most of them the numbers were very small. The overall deficit is more than accounted for by the costs of the uh, redevelopment in the uh, Glasgow College, um, as, we, as I said in my opening statement. So real progress has been made, but the operating margins are tight, and given the pressures we know are coming from um, rising costs, reducing uh, central government funding, and the costs of merger in the short term, we think there's, there are challenges that need to be carefully managed for the sector as a whole and for individual colleges. And the report does make very clear that um, uh, although the starting point is, is, is good, it is fragile, um, and also that the context in which the report takes place is quite significant change, very significant change, planned within the sector, the creation of the regional boards, and associated with that, uh, a number of college mergers, reducing the number of colleges uh, in Scotland. So it, it's worrying, I think, then, to see in paragraph 58, uh, Audit Scotland saying that um, and you repeated this there in your open, opening remarks, that the Scottish Government hasn't yet published, published a quantified assessment of the overall costs uh, of the reform of the college sector or indeed uh, the expected benefits. And then also in paragraph 64, that outcome agreements uh, at the moment concentrate on inputs and process but don't un indicate how the Scottish Government expect these changes in the college sector to produce a greater contribution to things like uh, employability and the development of an educated and skilled workforce. So is it fair to say that colleges are in a good place, they are now entering a period of very significant change, but what we're lacking is the rationale, justification the metrics and indeed the expected outcomes from that change. We think it's now time for um, exactly those specific uh, measures and uh, estimates of costs and benefits to be put in place. Um, first of all, because the individual colleges are operating to tight margins, small increases in costs or reductions in their income will have a significant impact on them. But more widely, because they play such an important role in the objective of sustainable economic growth, we know that the number of young people not in employment or education and training is um, rising at the moment. Um, and the need for the economy as a whole to change the direction of skills development, for example, to achieve the aim of a, a low carbon economy, means we need new skills coming from this sector. So more detailed planning for what that means through the outcome agreements and better estimating of the costs and benefits of the transition, we think are the two things needed to manage the risks of, of squaring that circle. But we have had um, quite a significant review, the Griggs Review, and we do have legislation planned in order to create the, 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 the regional boards. I mean, are you saying that we've gone from the review to the legislation without the intermediate stage of working out exactly why we're changing this sector and what we expect that change to achieve? I think the objectives at the high level um, are clear. What's not clear is um, the detailed estimating of the costs and benefits of the transition um, and the detailed um, uh, outcome measures within the outcome agreements for what the college sector and individual colleges should be contributing towards that. And they need that to be able to take the next step. Thanks very much. Anyone? Mr Griffin. Thanks, Kavina. Um, 
On page three, um, you have stated that um, uh, government revenue grant support to colleges is likely to fall from £545 million in 2011-12 to £471 million in 2014-15. Um, can you just confirm that you still think that's an accurate reflection of uh, the budget for Scotland's colleges? Yes, we're confident those figures stand. Thanks for that. Um, yesterday at the Education and Culture Committee, uh, the Cabinet Secretary for Education said um, the Audit Scotland report is accurate with regard to the published spending review figures, but not with regard to the actual figures for spend. I don't know if you're able to, to comment on, on the Cabinet Secretary's comments yesterday. Certainly. I'll ask Graham Greenhill to come in with the detail. Um, but the broad picture is that our figures for 2011-12 and 2014-15 are correct, and therefore the reduction over that period is correct. But since the spending review, there have been a number of one-off allocations in individual financial years for specific purposes, which amount to the £67.5 million referred to by the Cabinet Secretary. Graham can give you more detail about that. Okay. Um, yeah, um, I think the, the Cabinet Secretary said yesterday that... Uh, college finances can be quite uh, complex, and I, I wouldn't disagree with that statement. Um, September 2011 spending review, uh, as we have in the report, uh, indicated that uh, the funding council's revenue funding for colleges would increase from 545 million in 2011-12 up to 471 million in 2014 and 15. Uh, but as the cabinet secretary also said that uh, since the September 2011 spending review, additional money has been given uh, to colleges. Um, for example, 2011-12, uh, uh, an extra £11 million pound has been uh, allocated to the Funding Council uh, to give to colleges in respect of uh, college bursaries uh, and uh, additional places. Um, further budget addition, uh, which took effect for 2012-13, uh, released a £15 million pound college transformation fund to help colleges uh, begin to adapt to this, this structural fund. Um, the September 2012 spending review, it gave another £17 million to colleges in 2013-14, uh, again going through the uh, funding council and again to, to support um, bursaries and uh, college places. And uh, just a couple of weeks ago, there were further budget, uh, budget addition, additions uh, related to 2012-13, um, which uh, added another 11.4 million to the Funding Council's budget for colleges and 13.1 million to the budget for Skills Development Scotland. Um, which is to help fund short employability courses. Uh, and the idea is that these courses will be commissioned from colleges, so that money will uh, find its way to colleges. So, uh, if you add all that together, uh, an additional £11 million in 2011 12, uh, £39.5 million in 2012 13, £17 million in 2013 and 14. That ends up with a £67.5 million, pound, which Caroline just said uh, was, was what um, Mike Russell had said. Um, the point about this funding, however, is, is, is that it is one-off funding and there has been no addition to the 2014-15 budget. Um, so the 2014-15 uh, estimated uh, budget as set out in the September 2011 spending review of £470.7 million pound, uh, remains the, the, the current budget for that year. That on board. And so then, even though there has been additional monies um, allocated to particular years, then would you say, you've, you've stated already that you believe your figures are still correct. And so do you think um, the Cabinet Secretary was therefore incorrect to say that your figures um, weren't accurate, and would you confirm that you still believe that the reduction in college funding, um, as stated within the report, um, is going to be 24% in real terms? 
significant that the difference between the 2011-12 figures and the 2014-15 figures adjusted for inflation is a 24% reduction in real terms. Um, there are a number of movements, as Graham's outlined, in the financial years between then, mainly for special one-off purposes, um, that aren't um, at this stage committed in any way to be included in from 2014-15 onwards. So we're confident that our reduction is correct. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Mr. Griffin. Mr. Scott. Thank you very much. Um, I wonder if I can go back to Caroline Gardner's earlier answer to the convener on the um, level of detail, both financial and outcomes. Uh, did I understand uh, the Auditor General correctly in that she described um, the high level? Uh, strategy, for want of a better word, being clear, and indeed it's reflected in this report and reflected in other areas, uh, but the, the bit that's lacking is at both college and proposed regional level there at the moment, neither colleges nor the regional structures have yet got either numbers, budget details, or indeed um, outcome agreements, for want again of a better expression. Um, I think that's absolutely correct in terms of the, um, the outcome agreements for the contribution they're each intended to make to those high-level national objectives. The other bit of the jigsaw that isn't yet in place is the Scottish Government's assessment of the costs and benefits of uh, the structural reform, the, the creation of the regional boards and the mergers or federations of colleges, where there will almost certainly be savings in the, the medium term as well as improvements in planning. Um, but there will be, we know, a cost in getting from where we are now to where we expect to be in the future because of things like redundancy, relocation and so on. We don't know what the estimated cost of that is yet. And, and do, that's helpful. And do the regions that are proposed to be created yet know what their split of the budget and the answers that Graham Greenhill's just given in, reflect, in respect of the budget over the next three years, do they know in a, even indicative terms what those numbers will be yet? Um, I, I think at the moment they are planning on the assumption that their broad shares of the budget will remain as they currently are, and therefore that the reductions and indeed the additional funding that's available for the, the years in between will be allocated on that basis. But I'll ask Graham to come in and give you a bit more information. The, do you mean that they, when you say they, do you mean the individual colleges, because as yet we don't have these regional structures? The um, funding comes from Scottish Government to colleges via the Scottish Funding Council um, and it will be planning now on the basis of both the, the spending review um, forecasts and the additional um, amounts of money that have been uh, announced for the years between up until 2013-14. But I'll ask Graham to talk you through the detail of what people know at board level and college level. Um, the report made mention to uh, the development of outcome agreements for colleges uh, and as part of the agreement, part of the process for agreeing the, the first round of initial out outcome agreements, um, the Funding Council has been uh, agreeing budgets for 12-13 with the regions. So all the regions know how much uh, money is coming to them uh, for 2012-13. So ready? Well, no, no, the regional boards um, don't technically exist. So, but you can't allocate money to something that doesn't technically exist, surely? <laughs> or maybe you can. <laughs> Um, <coughs> Sorry, that's a very unfair question. It just strikes yeah, me yeah, it's a bit it's difficult uh, to give money to uh, something that doesn't exist. By definition, uh, the regions do not ex exist. Yeah. Uh, money has been allocated uh, at a regional level, but in practice, the individual colleges which make up each region knows how much money it's getting yeah. for 12, 13. But, but, but I guess my point in terms of, the, of your overall record or finding that there's a lack of clarity around the numbers as to what the regional costs are going to be and the costs of implementing this, by any standards, enormous change on the college sector in, in Scotland, is that while they know that for the next year, and do they therefore know that for the, for the spending review period, what element of those costs are going to be for the for the for regionalisation? What, what percentage, what number attaches now to the costs of regionalisation? I think that is what we're not clear about. There are two elements, the cost of regionalisation itself and potentially much more significant, the costs of bringing colleges together in mergers or federations. Um, we know, for example, from uh, press reports recently that the costs of the Edinburgh Colleges merger was expected to be about £10 million, has actually been about £17 million. People um, are confident that there are savings to be had as well as improvements in planning in the longer term by going through that. But there is a significant cost in the short term, especially against the background of falling resources over the spending review period. 
Okay, and at what level of, um, as it were, management are these changes being driven by? I appreciate the Scottish Government said what it wants to achieve, but uh, who is actually at a practical level going to deliver these enormous changes? I, I think it varies across different regions of Scotland, depending on how far ahead individual colleges are with their own merger proposals um, and the particular circumstances they're facing. Ronnie, would you like to bring a bit more detail on that point? In? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I think we were at pains to try in the report to respect the fact that there's a parliamentary process to still take place in relation to the legislation, um, as, as a, is the, the government itself, of course. However, uh, they, they have appointed individuals uh, around the proposed new regions to start the planning of um, these arrangements in order to try to manage the tr transition. Um, but I think what we were trying to go over in the report is that this is going to be quite a complex exercise taking place over a, a period of time. And uh, the more planning and the more effective planning that can be put in place in terms of being clear about objectives, how those very specific objectives will relate to the broad strategy objectives that have been outlined in the consultation documents, uh, those are the things that need to be uh, put in place uh, as quickly as possible uh, in order to, uh, to navigate through this uh, very complex uh, period. No, that's very fair. But your example of Edinburgh and, uh, and also your, your earlier reporting to change within the you know, mergers of, of public bodies more generally across Scotland tend to illustrate that, yes, you could achieve savings in the longer term, but in the short term, inevitably or, or usually, costs were higher than projected. At the moment, we don't even have costs, projected costs on mergers, do we? You, you haven't got them, and nor in that sense does Parliament. The Scottish Government hasn't set out the expected costs and benefits of the structural reform programme, which is part of its wider um, objectives and aims for this sector in the education and learning um, policy area. But, but I'm, my, I guess my point is, I'm driving at is that your recommendations to us as an audit committee in the past have been very clear about the need for those figures to be available at the earliest possible date. Well, here we are just about to have, and we still don't have them. I mean, I've recommended the government should yeah. produce them. Okay. So we don't have right. them. Right. Point taken. Final question, Convener, if I may, and that is on paragraph 41. Um, you've got the, the, the report, sorry, Audit Scotland report has a very interesting sentence which says that while the Scottish Funding Council does not record the numbers of people applying to attend college, and then there's some about learning activity, I was staggered by that. Do we not actually know how many people apply and don't get in? There aren't national figures for that, and it's clearly been a matter of some um, both political and media interest over the last few months. Graham, I think, can give you a more up-to-date picture of where we are with that. I would imagine that individual colleges will have a information about a demand for uh, their classes. Uh, of course, that doesn't prevent the same one individual applying to two or three colleges at the same time. So, as Carolyn said, there is no national picture of uh, the number of people applying for college places. But it's very difficult, is it not, to justify a change for whatever reason if you don't know what your numbers are that would justify that change? I, mean, I take your point that someone can apply to three, but the system should be clever enough to work that one out. Tavish Scott applies to three different colleges. His name should ping up three times in the statistics. But we just don't collect... As a government, uh, you know, it doesn't matter who the government is, the government do not collect statistics which would help them to make proper decisions about the level of demand in Scotland today. It's not collected by either the Scottish Government or the Funding Council, which might be a, a more appropriate place for the collection to happen, given their, their responsibilities for funding to colleges and in future to the regional boards. Do you come to a view as to whether you think that collection of those statistics would help both the Funding Council and thus Parliament make a judgment on these matters? My view is that um, more information on the right things is always yeah. useful, okay. um, and it's one of the things that should be picked up in the outcome yeah. agreements that okay. have been put together. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Mr. Scott. Colin Beatty. Thank you, Dan. I'm looking at uh, two paragraphs, number 25 and number 30. Obviously, um, it's good that colleges do have a surplus, but it is public funds, and you know the, it, it should be getting used uh, for a purpose. What, what I'm asking is, mention is made of uh, the, ne the necessity for or the good practice for colleges to have a certain amount of prudential reserves, uh, and SFC says 60 days. What proportion of this surplus of 206 million is actually project related, and how much is actually uh, earmarked for uh, for this prudential reserve? I'm not sure we've got a, a breakdown of the figures for 2010-11, um, although I'll ask uh, Graham to confirm whether I'm right on that uh, in a moment. Um, we do know that it varies a lot between colleges, that some colleges who are expecting significant change and merger are deliberately building up surpluses that they can use for that purpose. 
Graham, can we be more specific? I don't think I could uh, uh, be more specific in, in that, no. This report is put together from the College's financial statements for the last last um, audited financial year. Um, the uh, most recent financial year finished at the end of July, um, and we're now looking at how we can use that information to provide a richer and more nuanced picture earlier in 2013 to support the Parliament's consideration of the um, wider reform agenda. Okay. Um, turning to the uh, page... Uh, what page it is, actually? 12. Uh, Paragraph 28, pension reserves. Pensions always seem, pension funds always seem to be a wee bit of a sort of Damocles over everybody's head these days. I mean, we're talking about a, a potential deficit here of 60 million, and potentially at some point, in spite, I mean, there's, there's some points we made here where there's, been, there's a benefit to the fund, but it's still increasing. You know, the change from the retail prices to consumer prices index, that sort of thing, increase in contributions, and yet it is still increasing for a number of reasons that have been stated here. Um, how long can that run before the colleges actually have to address that? As with all public sector pension schemes, it is a long-term problem, but it's a real problem. Um, we know that for all the pension schemes, at some point, the um, liabilities will have to be brought back into line with the assets where there is a fund, as there is for the, the college's pension scheme, um, and that that will require adjustments to contribution level, levels from both the employers and the employees or changes to um, the retirement age or the other variables that go into the mix. Obviously, the investment performance of the funds is also important in that. Um, we don't think that in the case of colleges, it's a more significant problem than it is for the other public sector pension funds, but it is something that needs to be taken into account in terms of long-term sustainability. There's no avoiding those long-term liabilities. Okay, thanks, Ms. Scanlon. Uh, thank you. Given that uh, Collins uh, asked about the pensions, um, can I just ask a supplementary on that? It wasn't just the figure of 60 million that caused me concern. It's the fact that that, that 60 million was actually 10 million in 2007, and uh, that there's been a, a, a six-fold yeah. increase in uh, as many years. Uh, so. It's not the ballpark figure, it's the fact that the figure is increasing sixfold. Does that cause you concern in relation to this sector and colleges moving forward? It's obviously a concern, um, but there's a sort of odd um, characteristic of this sector. Because the pension schemes are funded, um, there has been a significant impact on the assets that they have invested to meet future liabilities since 2007 because of the global financial crisis and the impact we've seen on stock markets <coughs> since then. Um, it, it obviously is a, a serious problem in the short term that will have to be managed over the long term no matter what. Um, but in a sense, it looks more significant simply because there are funds there to be invested than it would if it were an unfunded pension scheme as some of the other large and much larger pension schemes in the public sector are. So given that it is a funded uh, pension scheme like local government, you know, where does the money come from in order to make up the, uh, the deficit and the level of payouts that are required and will be required increasingly given the economies of scale and efficiency savings which we hope will be uh, brought forward by the mergers? It is a, a complex and long-term question. Um, there's a number of factors that come into play that will have to be managed over that period, um, including um, the level of contributions by both employers and employees, the investment performance of the funds, um, the age of retirement of people, um, of scheme members, um, and the, the way in which um, all of that comes together to make sure that as the liabilities fall due, they can be afforded. Um, it's important for me just to, to put on the record that these aren't liabilities that will ever fall due on one day. They have a, a long life scale, lifetime of 40 years or more as current members of the scheme head towards retirement and start to um, become entitled to their benefits. And that's the time scale over which they must be managed. But you're absolutely right, it's harder to do that <coughs> in the current climate where market returns are very low and where public sector spending cuts are um, affecting the um, budgets of colleges and the, the take-home pay of the, the members of the scheme. 
Okay, my, my next question is also supplementary, and it's really supplementary to Mark Griffin and uh, Tavish's question. Uh, I, I did have the, the honour of sitting in an education committee, and uh, I do congratulate Mr Greenhill for explaining the figures, because uh, Professor Jeremy Peat looked at them two or three times and couldn't understand them, and two college principals uh, said there was a downward trend and they couldn't understand them, and of course the Education Secretary says that they're complex. But I wonder if I can just ask you one question. My understanding from trying to grapple with these figures is that, and Mr Greenhill mentioned the different pots of funding alongside the cuts. My understanding is that the main cut has been to the teaching grant. Did you drill down to that? My understanding is that that is the specific, the additional monies have been ring-fenced for student support, etc. Am I right in saying, or did you drill down, Am I right in saying that it is the teaching grant, it is the frontline teaching grant that has uh, borne the brunt of these cuts? We haven't fully drilled down to that okay. level yet. Graham had the advantage or disadvantage, however you look at it, of spending yesterday evening following up on the Education Committee um, discussion to make sure we did understand the movements and we can provide you with a note of that. Um, we do have more work to do to look at what the implications of that are and the diff different elements of the support to colleges. Well done, convener. If I may point out, paragraph 42 caused me serious um, uh, cause for concern, and really just the latter half of that paragraph. Uh, Scotland's colleges uh, gave evidence to the Education Committee based on current models and configurations of colleges took on one, only one, in four 16 to 19 year olds not in education, employment or training, and they continued to service the 18 to 24 year olds to the same level, there would be no, none, <laughs> no funded provision left for older learners who make up half of learners over 16. Uh, and having spent 20 years lecturing economics and further in higher education before coming here, I feel very passionate about people at an older age who, you know, jobs or careers haven't worked out and they are given a second chance. So what you're really saying is the government's commitment to 16 to 18 year olds and the college commitment to service 18 to 24 year olds means mature students haven't got a chance. Um, we can't give you the, the detailed figures um, to answer the first part of your question. It is clear, though, that against the background of um, funding reductions over the spending review period and the increasing demand that comes from both the number of younger people who aren't in employment or training and the need to reskill older workers to meet the demands of the economy that we want to have in future, there is a real pinch here. Um, and it's one of the reasons why we think it's so important that the government should set out the expected costs and benefits of the structural reform and make progress on the outcome agreements that will help to pin down exactly which students will be, um, will be able to receive support from the sector. I think Ronnie may want to add to that. Yes, I mean, the paragraph, that section of the paragraph you referred to is a direct quote from Scotland, Scotland's colleges uh, at, the, at the committee, um, obviously um, explaining its, its view of the consequences of, 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 of cuts. Um, our concern is to ensure that um, the range of policy objectives that exist across the structural changes and also the educational objectives that are there, such as the commitment to 16 to 19 year old students, um, is uh, looked at and managed in the round. The outcome agreements is an obvious place where that can happen and the rationing of reduced money um, being um, being organised um, you know, holistically, if you like, across, across the range of objectives that exist. My point is that the you know the main objectives are 16 to 24 year old, and my point is the displacement, and the lack of opportunities and the increased <coughs> inequalities for older learners. Um, my final question, convener, is um, quite recently we obviously looked at the public sector mergers and the lessons learned, and it seemed a, a good idea just to look back at that in terms of. Uh, as Tavish Scott was talking about moving forward to college mergers and uh, in a joined up Scotland, I would have hoped that uh, the lessons learned in your Audit Scotland report uh, would be brought forward. Um, so if I could just very briefly um, quotes from the previous Audit Scotland report uh, that uh, mergers, they didn't know what success would look like. 
They didn't know the new benefits expected. Uh, they didn't consider how service improvements uh, would be expected. Uh, as Tabby Scott has said, they couldn't confirm costs or savings. There was inadequate analysis of savings and efficiencies. They didn't know which efficiency savings came as a result of the merger or might have happened anyway. And I think as Colin Beatty said uh, today or previously, there was very little, if any, baseline information in the first year of operation on unit costs, staffing and quality of the service. Uh, now, I was listening carefully to your answer to Tavish Scott. I just wanted to extend it, really, to look at have these lessons, these critical lessons, have they been learned? Are you confident that although this is not in place at the moment, are you confident that it will be in place and that uh, the difficulties faced in previous mergers and uh, costs expected that weren't realised, are you confident that the college mergers have learned lessons and they will deliver? The Scottish Government, when my report was published, um, did accept the recommendation and has agreed to publish um, the expected costs and benefits of the um, structural reform and specifically the mergers. Um, I very much hope that will take account of the range of information we think is needed and the lessons learned from that report and we look forward to seeing it. Including the outcomes and the opportunities to students? Absolutely. They're all the things that are needed to, first of all, manage the costs of getting to where we need to be and then making sure that the expected benefits are achieved in practice. It's, um, I mean, I'm sure the, the commitment's a welcome one, but is it fair to say that those criteria which your previous report found were missing in previous uh, public sector mergers are all missing in this case as well? At this stage, they're not available, yes. Okay. Thank you. Mr Dornan. Thank you, convener, and, and welcome. Uh, can I thank uh, Graeme Greenhill in particular for just clarifying the Cabinet Secretary's comments yesterday and just putting on the record that there was absolutely no intention of confusing or misleading the, the committee yesterday, which is, I suspect, what Mr Griffin was trying to allude to. Uh, can I also say that Should just... make assumptions about what other colleagues... Well, OK, are, uh, which I'm mind. confident that Mr Griffin was, uh, was uh, trying to infer. Uh, can, I, can I just have a supplementary then to Tavish Scott's point about the record of numbers of people applying to colleges? Would you agree that the, the, this period just now of, of the mergers may well be a good opportunity then for when new systems are in place to begin to do that, because I do agree that it would be very important information for us in, in, in terms of moving forward for figures. I think the mergers do provide an opportunity to um, put the systems in place to collect and, and bring together nationally those figures, but they are also important for thinking about not just the mergers themselves, but the outcome agreements that the new colleges and the college boards should be signing up to. Absolutely. And can I ask just uh, one other question? Uh, Mary talked about the previous Audit Scotland report, learning the lessons of public body mergers, and you mentioned college mergers, previous college mergers in it. Has there been any work done to see what the financial benefits or otherwise of previous college mergers have been, and has, has that helped to help write this report? We haven't done that. I'm not sure if the Funding Council have. I'll ask Ronnie to come in on that question, if I may. Yes, there's, there's been developing um, in learning, if you like, from, from the recent uh, mergers that have taken place. We um, offered a little bit of a case study there, and we know that in the city of Glasgow College, um, they've been um, engaging with colleagues about their experience in that regard. Um, the Scottish Funding Council also recently um, published and issued guidance on mergers, which uh, takes account of our uh, generic um, report on mergers as well. So there's been a number of things recently put into place to try to uh, support the mergers process. Thanks, Mr. Vernon. Sorry. I'll be as uh, short as I, as I can. Uh, listen to all the different, uh, you know, viewpoints, etc. Uh, the convener said at the very beginning, uh, colleges are in a good place. And I'd just like to confirm, is that correct? Colleges are in a good place. I think you said yourself, and the convener also said that very word. 
college sector as a whole has come a long way since the problems earlier in the first mm -hmm. decade of this century um, and the, the margins to which they're operating are very tight given the pressures they're facing in future. <coughs> But they are in a good place because that's what's been quoted. I just I was getting a bit confused when the, the convener came out and said that, but that's not the question I do want to ask. I'm very interested in the recommendations that you mentioned, and in particular, you know, for the future and the strategic uh, planning, page four, uh, the last uh, paragraph, and the second recommendation, the last recommendation, sorry, uh, regarding you know ensuring that uh, colleges work together with you know local businesses and the local community, etc. With this, the regional structures that's going to come about, would this help to facilitate that? Because one of the issues I'm very interested in is about community planning partners also, which would seem to me that it's not just about education, but it's more in around with everyone involved in the different regions. That's certainly one of the objectives the Scottish Government has set for structural reform, and it seems to us that the mergers could well help to achieve that. At the moment, the pattern of colleges tends to reflect um, the old local authority responsibility, um, where it sat um, until 10 years or so ago. So there's still a bit of historic patterns of provision, and colleges to an extent have been competing with each other for students. So bringing them together under the regional boards um, and beneath that with the mergers and federations of colleges lets you take a more strategic approach to what course provision is needed where, how that meets the needs of local young people, of older learners, of um, industry and business locally. Um, so there, there's a real opportunity here. We'd like to see that set out as part of the costs and benefits that are expected and the individual outcome agreements between the Funding Council and the colleges. I do agree with you, it's very important we do get these um, you know, plans set out as soon as possible, basically. Uh, the other one I, I wanted to ask is in the recommendations, and it's the third and the very last one there. Explore opportunities to reduce costs. Now we had the report regarding Ross earlier about the huge big IT system. Uh, when you're mentioning about the recommendations, would this be for individual colleges to pull the resources, perhaps to IT systems, or you know, I just wondered what what you you meant by them, you know, obviously exploring opportunities uh, to try and save money. Potentially there's a range of ways it could happen and again it's one of the expected benefits the Scottish Government has set out for its reform programme. It could be things like um, IT systems being shared, um, shared services for finance staff, HR staff, some of the background um, services that most colleges have got now. It might be by rationalising provision, making sure that your courses for a particular type of subject are in one place with the opportunities for savings that might bring. I think the key point for us is that without the clarity about um, the outcome agreements and the way they'll work in practice, we just don't know what those expected savings might be and how far they will <coughs> offset the costs in the long term. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. Uh, just uh, so that Sandra White's clear, I think my initial remarks were that the colleges are in a financially sound place in 2010-11. That's a good place to be. My view would be that if you reduce their income by 24% in real terms, they're unlikely to be in a good place uh, by 2013-14. And on that, we had some discussion there about what the colleges count. And one thing they do count is the number of students they have. And the report refers to a number, a figure, I think, of 300,000 students, which I appreciate is not 300,000 full-time students, uh, but 300,000 students. Um, I, I, I'd just like to ask if, uh, and you've, you've said that Audit Scotland's figure of a 24% lower in real terms uh, revenue budget by 2013-14, if that's the case, is it conceivable, remotely conceivable, that by 2013-14 our colleges can be providing learning opportunities for 300,000 students? Um, it, it's a real challenge. Um, the 306,000 uh, figure for students needs unpacking a bit as well um, because one of the things that's happening is that we have fewer part-time students and more full-time students coming through colleges. And if you'd like to know more about that, I think Graham is the person who can take you through the technicalities of it. But it certainly is going to be a challenge to meet the demand which we know is there now, which may well increase in future, um, both as the economy tries to shift to, for example, a low-carbon economy, and we try to get younger people into meaningful training against a background of significant funding reductions. It, it's a difficult circle to square. And the other 
complexity is the difference between revenue and capital funding, which we haven't talked about in a, a note in paragraph 46, um, a reference to the reductions in public se sector capital funding available to colleges over the next three years, meaning that they're unlikely to be able to sustain the, the same level of, of new build campuses. Um, and I think in the past, um, the Cabinet Secretary, uh, and indeed I think the First Minister, has said that if you look at college funding in the round and include both revenue and capital funding, that actually there isn't a reduction in budgets, but, but paragraph 46 combined with the 24% reduction in revenue funding must surely mean that in the round there is a reduction expected over the next few years in, in funding for the college sector. Is that fair? There is a, a reduction planned between 11, 12, and 14, 15 in, in total um, funding for the college sector, both revenue and capital. To make sure I don't confuse the issue by getting figures wrong, I'll ask Graham to clarify what, what that difference is. Uh, yes, the, uh, the budget figures that we have at the moment for um, capital funding for colleges, that's funding uh, coming from the Funding Council, falls, is, due, is expected to fall. Uh, from 45 million in 2011 and 12 to 27 million pounds in 2014-15. Um, the Scottish government's um, written evidence to the Education and Culture Committee yesterday uh, spoke about funding of uh, sorry investment. I think it's important to make a difference uh, between in, to, to draw a distinction between investment and funding. But um, that submission spoke about investment increasing from £590 million in 2011 and 12 up to £655 million, I think it was, in 2014 and 15. Now, that 2011-12 figure is the combined capital and revenue funding coming from the Funding Council to colleges. The 2014 and 15 uh, figure uh, includes £157 million pound planned investment, which uh, the private sector is planning to put into college estates redevelopment work, uh, basically college campuses being uh, funded through the non-profit distribution model. So that's why, you know, the overall picture is investment. Just to try and be clear, that, that figure, the second figure includes capital value of a project which is actually being delivered by a, a PFI contract? Yep. Yeah. Um, well, no, no, no longer called PFI. No, not called um, that. Uh, Non-profit uh, distribution uh, model. The likes of Glasgow College, for example. Uh, um, big new campus being planned. Procurement exercise currently underway. Um, but it's being funded through the non-profit distribution model. Which Mr Swinney has said as a member of the PFI family, I think, if we go back and look. So that, so, so that figure includes the whole value of that, that project, the asset value for, of that Well, for, for that pl the planned investment for that year, 2014-15. Okay. Again, Sh surely, Mr Scott. Can I just, uh, I mean, that's, uh, just to, so I get this absolutely right in my thick brain. Um, so it wouldn't be, you're not comparing, or I would not be comparing like with like, um, would I, in that sense? Because that money is, is obviously very different from the traditional forms of, of capital procurement that you described in the 2011, 12, sorry, 10, 11 figure. Would that be true? Um, the, the Funding Council is giving uh, colleges capital investment money. Um, but the, but so it's should just trust at the moment or no, anything like that, no, right? No, it's coming from the Funding Council. Yeah, so it's a direct, in that sense, it's government grant to the Funding Council, yes. to colleges for capital. And in the future, what you're describing is a, is a government grant, uh, no, not a government grant, you're describing a Scottish Futures private sector investment in the college private campuses, which is a different yes. form of investment altogether. And I think it, it's worth being clear that the 157 million element of the total figure that relates to NPD will deliver um, improved <coughs> infrastructure for colleges, which is important, and will also have a revenue consequence for capital's budgets. They will have to meet the capital cost of that on a continuing basis once the investment has been made. And is that capital cost, that, that revenue implication of that Scottish Futures Trust investment clear and detailed? Not at this stage, I think. 
Oh, that's another one we just don't know about. Um, the, the figures were the, these are the figures which were discussed just in the last few days in the submission to and um, yes, discussion I with the education that. committee. Yes. So what we've been able to do is to reconcile the 655 million to the figures in our reports and demonstrate how they relate to each other. The 157 we don't yet have detail on in terms of the revenue consequences, but there will be revenue consequences. Thank you. So we Mr. will Coffey. provide a note on Sorry. this convener if you're, yeah, if you're comfortable. Helpful. I think yes. it's very complicated. I, I, I mean, Mr. Greenhill did suggest earlier that he could. Yeah provide some detail on this for the committee and I, I think that would be helpful because I think everybody is acknowledging that the um, finances are complex. Sorry Mr Coffey. I was going to ask some questions on capital funding and so on but you, you kind of came in on that in your, your round just previously there. Um, maybe I could just turn to a, an aspect that's actually in the report rather than some of the matters that are not in the report and we might hope to be in the future. Could I draw your attention to the comment that you've made on page 10 there about the overall financial standing of the college sector being generally sound and so on? And uh, Auditor General, you mentioned that the accumulated surpluses are £206 million. And then just below that, and you say and it has a combined £205 million of cash and cash equivalents. A simple question just now, do you mean, does that mean £411 million? That's, a, that's two separate... What does um, it mean? Yeah. No, I think you can't add them together, no. but I will ask Graham to, to take um, you through the detail of it. The income, expe the, the income and expenditure reserve is a reflection of college's ability to generate year-on-year -year surpluses over a number of years. Now, um, that is different from uh, cash, cash equivalents. Cash, cash equivalent um, basically comprises... Um, free cash, which is available to uh, uh, pay for ongoing running costs like monthly salary bills, uh, so on and so forth, um, plus investment money. Now, um, some of that cash will undoubtedly have been generated uh, through the accumulation of year-on-year um, -year surpluses, but you can't really add the two together. It would be double counting to add the two together million pounds really that's that's yeah. the figure accurate but thanks for that in paragraph uh, 26 you mentioned that figure again and, and that cash reserve or asset has has doubled since 2006 7 which which i wanted to say convener i think is a testimony testimony to the to the good performance for the college sector over a number of years and i think i probably read the previous report in 2006 7 at a previous audit committee so i wanted to ask you that, that looks like a really, really good story to tell. They're hiding in that little paragraph. And what's principally responsible for that doubling of the cash assets of the college sector in that short space of time? Um, again, we probably need to make a, a distinction between income and expenditure and cash. Um, the, in the income and expenditure reserve uh, has been accumulated over a number of years through college's ability to... Um, you know, deliver year-on-year -year surpluses. Um, if you look at Exhibit 5 on page 12, you see how much of that income and expenditure reserve belongs to each individual um, college. How colleges have been able to, individually been able to generate that income and expenditure reserve is probably um, you know, best answered by colleges. But if I was to, you know, perhaps give an example um, say, say Aberdeen, for example. Um, Aberdeen has got a healthy income and expenditure reserve uh, built up through surpluses over a number of years. Um, How has he been able to do that? Well, it's a big college, so there might be economies of scale in there. Um, secondly, you know, uh, the oil industry it might have benefited from the oil industry in as much that it have, might have been able to uh, develop training courses which are delivered and paid for by the private sector in oil-related type subjects. So how colleges have got there probably differs by each college, and the colleges themselves would probably be better equipped than I am to explain how they got to that position. Yeah, very interesting. I mean, I mean it is a, a message I do recall from our previous time here that these cash reserves are healthy within the college sector. And I suppose my next question is, where do these reserves and assets go when we move into the merger process and presumably they'll become 
the cash reserves for the new merged body. But to what purpose will these reserves be put in the future? I do see them accumulating year on year, and it's a great story, and it has to be commended. So I'm interested to find out, given the economic climate that we're in and so on, with budgets being cut from the UK to the Scottish Government, and we can argue about that all day, this is a healthy side of the story in terms of the college performance over a number of years, and I'm keen to find out how this money will be deployed in that future that we all face. Some of these um, reserves will have been built up deliberately with the aim of enabling either mergers or redevelopment of college campuses that might deliver savings and other benefits in future. So part of it is planned. It's, it's not just like having a piggy bank where people are putting money away year on year. Very often they are built up with a specific purpose in mind. Um, one of the reasons why we think the, it's important for the Scottish Government to set out the expected costs and benefits is that these reserves are one source of part of the costs that might be required to do that, potentially. Um, the um, Funding Council has put a lot of effort into ensuring the financial sustainability of colleges over the period, and again you'll recall from the discussions about individual colleges that were struggling um, seven or ten years ago that we're not seeing that to the same extent now. We would expect the reserves that are being built up to transfer to the new merged colleges or to be available to the federations where that's the preferred approach. But it, it's something that's not clear yet from the way in which the regional boards will carry out their responsibilities and may vary from place to place. Okay. Thanks for that. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much uh, to uh, colleagues from Audit Scotland, and we we'll look forward to Mr. Greenhill's <laughs> elucidation of further education sector finance. Uh, that should be a treat. Uh, we'll now move to private session. I invite uh, the Audit Scotland witnesses to remain with us to give evidence and ask any members of the press or public to leave.